Hello, Brenda, Randy, and Megan. I want to say, first of all, thank all of you for agreeing to today's conversation on truth and reconciliation. I'd like us just really to start with a moment of silence um, so that we're reflective and mindful about the fact that coming to uh, have a conversation about systemic racism is very serious work. And I'd like us to open our spirits up to the thought that we'll be very honest today and hopefully transform other people's lives by hearing our stories. Thank you. <clears throat> There's a lot going on uh, today with COVID-19 and the civil unrest. And all of you have very unique uh, backgrounds in terms of the lens through which you would see this current crisis unfolding. I'd like, if we could, to have each of you to share a little bit about who you are so that our viewers have a sense of you and your experience or understanding of systemic racism. So we can start with whoever would like to go first. It looks like you're not. It looks like you've just, well, Randy, by silent majority, uh, you have been selected. That. Um, well, my name is Randy DeFore. I'm a native of Jacksonville, born and raised here, multi-generational. Um, I'm a, a lawyer. I work for Fidelity National Financial um, and also city council, and I'm an Episcopalian. My husband is the canon to the ordinary. Uh, you, you know, the question of systemic racism is a difficult question for me. You know, what is, because a lot of times I think we're blind to what that means or what it, actually exists, and I, you know, and I certainly have my blind spots, um, but if I were to boil it down in terms of my understanding of it, it's, it's, it's basically those that have and those that have not, mm -hmm. and how do we address the inequity of that? I, I am Brenda Alexis Priestley Jackson. I am a Jacksonville native. Uh, I am fourth generation on my dad's side, but my mother's family were enslaved in Fernandina, the Alpertis, so that goes back several generations. I'm a wife and a mom and an educator and an attorney and a colleague of Randy's on the city council. And I'm a member of historic Mount Zion African Methodist Episcopal Church, which is a few blocks over um, from us. And so I am someone that has probably centered a lot of my life on making certain that there are equitable and access and opportunities, particularly for people of color. Um, I actually did my independent study in law school at the University of Florida on affirmative action and how we remedy the impact of historic and structural racism. And as timely as it was then, it's even uh, more, more timely, timely now. now. And so I always tell folks that I share with, if you see any inequity, um, and inequities can be relegated to ethno-racial differences and inequities you see in those groups, gender, ableism, the list goes on, you have to ask yourself why. And oftentimes it leads back to some policy decision or law that did not place individuals equally at the onset. Absolutely. I am Megan Cochran. I am a member of this cathedral. Um, would this be an appropriate time to share the story I shared with you? Oh, sure. In terms of, yes. Um, so 
I am only alive because of white privilege. I am the embodiment of it. My father was arrested at the age of 18 with a group of other young men who had been in and out of the system. Um, he grew up in downtown Birmingham. And um, when he went before the judge for sentencing, he was told that the other boys had been sent to prison, but because he was white, he was going to be given the choice of enlisting in the army or going to prison with his friends who were black. So he chose the army and he ended up in Chicago on the GI Bill where he met my mom and here I am. Um, and in terms of systemic racism, that the judge could do that and that it wasn't probably just one judge in the history of Birmingham or anywhere else in this country that that happened. Um, and that I believe that that happens throughout businesses, it's happened throughout government, um, and the effects that trickle down over generations, and we don't even see it. Um, you can't look at me and know that that's the only reason I'm alive, was because my father was white, and he was arrested with a group of black boys. I mean, you know, um, it's just so pervasive, and it's part of the fabric and fabric of the society. So I'm grateful to be able to be here and talking with you all about this. And well, well, first of all, I think just the opening introduction of each of us, of each of you, in terms of your orientation to this conversation, sets us up for a really deep um, kind of discussion about how we got here. Um, Randy, you said that um, it's a challenging issue uh, for you yes. in terms of um, how one even thinks about systemic racism or the idea, because there's, there, and I'm using this word in a way, or this phrase in a way that suggests people automatically agree that it exists, and I'm quite aware that there's a great gap uh, for some of us as to whether or not systemic racism exists. So I don't want um, to appear that I'm saying everyone here agrees that it exists. Um, I'm saying that in my life, I have found evidence of its existence. In my studies, I have found evidence of its existence. And so um, I'm, I'm laying it out in that way. But if any of you have something that's contrary to that experience, please feel equally uh, free to, to share it in the way that you've experienced it or not. Um, but for you, uh, Randy, you said that um, you wear a number of hats, number one, and uh, how, does, how does the conversation, ha or ha are you having any conversations about this issue, given the kind of turbulence we've seen socially? Oh, absolutely, and I'm having a lot of conversations with my children, who all think that, you know, they have the answers, and, uh, <laughs> and I'm clueless. But uh, they may not be completely incorrect about some of it. But, you know, um, I, I think it is a difficult situation because for someone like me who was given a lot of opportunities, even though I had my own, have had my own challenges just being a woman, um, I, it is, there's a lot that I don't understand because I haven't personally experienced it, and I know that. Uh, you know, I've had, I have an, my own story about um, the uh, law enforcement, and I saw firsthand that there is inequality today, for sure, with, when it comes to our African-American friends and neighbors. And that, because of that, I got on the Innocence Project of Florida and tried to use my, what I could, my talent, in any way I could to try to help uh, address that issue. But we have lots of justice reform that has to be done. I mean, there's a ton of work that has to be done. And, and I can tell you that people like Brenda Priestley Jackson, who I admire greatly, um, is really leading the charge. And anything that I can do to assist, I'm, I plan on doing that. Wow, well, 
Um, Brenda, when we were in conversations about names to uh, of people to invite to the conversation, um, your name came up again and again and again um, by a very kind of broad cross-section of people. Uh, so it was evident to me in, in our preparation for, um, for this last session um, that it was very important for you to be here and for us to uh, draw from the wisdom uh, and the visceral experiences uh, you have had. And so I'd like for you uh, to share with us uh, as, um, as an African-American woman um, how you have navigated um, this, this challenge of systemic racism. And so I think it's very interesting um, for me uh, personally because my parents reared me in such a way that I was a relentless questioner, well-loved, very confident, and didn't feel any way subjugated because of my ethno-racial identity as an African-American. And that's important. So I've never had a deficit view of blackness. Yes. And, and I would just say, but why? I just had this inherent sense of fairness as a kid, and so I was the but why kid. But why, mom and dad? But why? That's not right. That's not fair. And so my parents would just give me so much to read and, and um, talk with me a lot. So I was engaged, and I was also a beneficiary um, because I started first grade in Duval County the first year of mandatory busing, which meant I have no lens of segregated public schools. Yes. So I was four years old, three really turning four years old, going on the bus. And so um, I can't say that I had a way to process differences in treatment with an understanding that someone thought I was less than because I came from a community and parents that said you're not. You know, that also said you can't be as good as you've got to be better. I processed it a lot more as a wife and a mom. And it looked really different then. Wow. And um, my husband, who is my college sweetheart, uh, we've been together for 31 years. He's from New Jersey, so we met at Grambling State University yes. um, when we were in college. His, he grew up in central New Jersey, Somerset, New Jersey. And he shares this story that he came to Florida when he was 13 or 14 with his kung fu team. Yes. And they were walking, they were going to Disney World, and they were walking, I guess, back to the hotel. And he said a pickup truck full of white men called them niggers. And he said that was his image of Florida until he met me. Now that happened at 13. We don't meet until seven, eight years later. And so he said, it just didn't seem like an open and inclusive place. And I said, well, that's not mine. That was, that was not my experience. And then I had to separate personal experiences from tokenism. Yes. So, so I came of age when you check the boxes. Do we have a woman? Do we have a... African American, do we have a Latino or Hispanic, do we have someone older? Yeah. And so that was a part of my experience. You think it organically grows, but it was a very purposeful um, designation. But it hit home with our sons. So we have four children. Our oldest is 31, a daughter. And then our older son is 28. Our younger son is 23. And our youngest, who's sitting in the, over there with me, is 19. So after 30 years of rearing kids, we joke and say we're empty nesters and COVID-19 comes in, you're really not. Uh, but my, our sons are really big guys and they were brought up um, with high expectations and a certain freedom of their spirit, but their dad and I told them you can always be free. So things such as telling your children when they start driving, when you're teaching them how to drive, you're teaching them how to engage the police. And this is before Trayvon Martin. And this wasn't just my son's, this is our daughter too. She's my height, I'm six feet tall. She's very thin. And I said, when a policeman gets behind you, pull over, call me on your cell phone immediately, 
and tell the policeman, keep your hands visible. I'm on the phone with my mom, who happens to be my attorney. And that was just a natural thing that we did. You say it was natural. Natural. To teach that. Natural. 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 I, I just really want that to sit with us for a moment, because I know it's natural for you and I to have that kind of education as part of learning to brush our teeth, as, as normalized as making sure we put on deodorant exactly. and take care of ourselves, our personal hygiene. Was that normal for you? Was it normal for you to have to make sure that you told your daughter how to engage the police? Um, my daughter is... This is for My oldest daughter is biracial. Um, and so I think when she was about four, the police came to the school to introduce themselves to the kids. It was a private school, so there was a few black children and the mostly white children. Um, and the police came and they did like the meet and greet and stuff and you know, the police are your friend. And that same week, I was listening to um, Wycliffe John and he's got a song about the killing of Amadou Diallo, who was shot 41 times in the back by New York police officers. Um, who were not found to have done anything wrong. Um, and so I'm listening to that song while I'm also thinking about the fact that she's at school meeting the police for the first time. And, um, and I just, I wept and I wept and I wept because I realized that it was a very different place for her than it was for me growing up. And, um, and my younger daughter is white and it has been very different hearing their experiences coming up through the world. Um, and it's a very different set of concerns and heartaches that I feel for my white daughter than my um, biracial daughter. And even though they're both girls, that intersection of race and gender adds um, deeper levels of heartache for my biracial daughter um, and her experiences in this world and how we have to interact and how we've had to learn because I wasn't raised to fear the police. Um, there is no need. <laughs> so I'm alive because of police generosity towards white people. Um, yeah, so it's just a whole different experience. So that's why when you say that the depth of what you're saying is often just passed over, not unpacked, unappreciated. So please continue with your Yeah, and so it's interesting. We didn't feel it was anything um, out of the ordinary. And so um, our daughter attended Douglas Anderson. Um, and we were talking with her and sharing, and she didn't think it was out of the ordinary because they grew up with a rich sense of self and a strong sense of their ethno-racial history and an awareness that others will not treat you fairly. Um, they may not presume you're intelligent and articulate. Be your best. You cannot be as good as you have to be better. And some have said that's an unfair burden to put on Black children. It's not. Every successful person that I know knows that has been told you cannot be as good as everybody else. You've got to yes. be better. So that's not a, a different lesson. And so telling, teaching our daughter who was stopped by the police. And I want to say this is not. It's not even gendered that way. It's really ethno-racial identification. She's coming home from Grambling in Mississippi, driving, and she has my dad's Cadillac. My father passed away, and we gave her his older Cadillac. It has no tents. It has a keep kids drug free tag, Florida, you know, on the swing, right. right? And the officer, she calls, she says, Mom, there's an officer behind me. I'm in Mississippi. I said, pull over. And, and she drives like my dad, an old person, slowly, <laughs> okay? So this is not yes. the person's on a speed. 
And she says the officer looks visibly startled when he gets to the window and realizes she's a female. Yes. He jumps. And she tells him, yes, officer, you pulled me over. I'm on the phone with my mom, so I'm speaking. She's an attorney. She's in Florida. And she requests that I keep this on. He says, well, can she, I want you to turn it off. I said, she's not turning it off. I say that. Yes. So he says, well, you know why I stopped you. She says, no, officer, I have no idea. He says, you were speeding. And I was like, not me. But that was his line. And so she went through it all. She got the ticket. We paid the ticket. Our son was stopped. Orlando, the one that's 28. Our 23-year-old was stopped. Um, coming from Callahan on Thanksgiving, house-sitting with his friend, um, a female, a white female, in a new development. Uh, and the, he leaves the house, and this is after Trayvon Martin, this is after Mike Brown, and that's important because he was the one to cry in my arms when those happened, because his brother was away at Princeton. Yes. And he says, Mommy, they just killed him. It doesn't matter, they just killed him, you know. So he's at University of Florida, and plays football for them, he's home for Thanksgiving. He goes to house sitting Callahan. Now, I would have told him, growing up on, in Jacksonville, Northside, we didn't always frequent Callahan. It had a different kind of reputation. Yes. Mm -hmm. It did, but you, know, you, don't, you don't want to pass your biases onto your kids. Absolutely. And so he's leaving the house to come back, and there's a white, white man out there with a gun. What are you doing? You're breaking the house. Cleese says he just runs to his car. Now, he drives a Ford F-150 pickup truck that says Salt Life, Gators, and all of that. It has tip. He drives slow, too. But when the police, that gentleman called the police clearly, and four police cars stopped him, he pulled over, and they all came to the car with their guns drawn. And at the time, he's 19, maybe, 18, 19. And he calls us, he tells them, and by his dad and I get in the call on Thanksgiving evening and go down. By this time, they've taken him out of the police car, they're letting him sit on the back of his cab, of his truck, and one of the officers saying, I don't feel good about this, this wasn't right. I said, you pulled up to him with your guns drawn. He wasn't speeding. Well, we had a call of a burglary. I said, a burglary to a dwelling, a burglary. Not an armed robbery, not an assault. And, you, and clearly you knew the car, because they told you. And he did everything they asked him to do, but he cried. My six foot five year old son cried. He got no ticket. We filed a complaint. It was addressed. But that was the experience. Just imagine. Had he been, I don't know how I responded if someone had four guns pointed at me because we said, call us. So he called. And he's crying on Thanksgiving. Who thinks you're going to get a call like that on Thanksgiving? After dinner with your son, he says, I'm going to go out sit with a friend for a while while she feeds these pet, you know, the, the animals while these people are in town. So that's, that's it as a black mother. That became my lived experiences through my children. So the only one who's not had that encounter with the police is our youngest. And she's 19, and she may not have it, but I wouldn't bet on it. And you, you tell your children, it's not normal, but it's going to probably happen. And my husband's been stopped. And he drove every kind of dad car imaginable, minivan, suburban. This is not flashy cars, you know? But he'd been stopped. Stopped when police saw him with our sons and said, I just want to stop and see who you were. It's going across the Matthews Bridge. You can pull me over with my son. I saw a Princeton sticking with it. I'd never, I didn't know who you were, and I'd never seen anyone who went to Princeton before. Translation, I'd never seen anyone black who had a Princeton sticker on their car before, and I saw you were black in the car because you could see. And, and so I, I don't know that I think it's black and white as much as I think it's blue. And that's what I try to tell people. It's not, that's not the black-white binary, that's blue. Those are police officers. That's the training. That's the systemic and structural racism in the training that allows you to profile certain groups that you've said are more criminal than others allow over-policing of certain communities. 
That's what we're wrestling with. And um, it hurts, you know, that hurts. Because I'm one of hope, and I believe people are of goodwill, but bad habits are hard to let go, right? And I think we did a disservice to our kids. Red and our kids are close in age. Because some did not get those conversations that we may have had about racism. My parents told me. My, someone said, well, when did you first realize you were black? I said, I've always known I was black. Yes. I, mean, I don't know. I remember my mommy telling me when I was going to get bused, because I had two perfectly good elementary schools in my neighborhood. Um, my mom called me Prissy, because I'm named after her, Brenda. She said, Prissy, you're going to go on a bus to school. And of course, it's a big yellow bus. I'm excited. Yes. And she says, but you're not going to go to school in the neighborhood. And I said, why? She says, well, the schools have been desegregated. They want black and white kids to go to school together. So you're going to go to school with mostly white kids. That's what she said. I said, OK. Right. And so my mom worked at Channel 7. She brought the TV cameras. My dad was a teacher. I thought everybody who had cool parents, their parents came to school to watch this going on. Your parents were not cool if they're not here. You know? <laughs> so I, I, I understood it. You follow what I'm saying? Yes, so it was absolutely. Not, yeah. Now, my brother, who is five years older, his would be different yes. because he got bust after, after desegregation. Yes. You know? And so he was uprooted. I wasn't uprooted because that became my rooting. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And it makes a great difference. I think we didn't think, we thought we were going to pass biases on our kids. So we didn't tell them some of the painful lessons. We didn't talk to them about privilege. We didn't talk to them about understanding to walk in someone else's shoes. Um, and we all have different um, privileges we experience. Yes. Um, but some are far more privileged than others, a presumption um, of innocence or a lesser sentence if you are not African American. Yes. You know? And so, you know what? I am a student of Derrick Bell. Yes. And Derrick Bell talks about the permanence of racism in American society. And people respond to that in one of two ways. They're, they feel, why would you say that? You're, you're, that's pessimistic. No, it's not. It's actually realistic to the point of first acknowledge it, then you begin to change it. Right. Yes. Totally agree. Mm -hmm. You know, so when I saw George Floyd or Maude Arbor, or you hear about Breonna Taylor or Sandra Bland, it just became too familiar, you know? There are patterns in all of it, right? Whether it's police or state-sanctioned actions of the police that target black people. If we say that we're dealing with it, yes. the structural racism, the vestiges of a country that was founded based on race. Now, let's be clear. A country founded to subjugate people of African descent in slavery, taken from people of native ancestry who were already here, wealth accumulated based on free labor. That's how we were founded. It's hard to get away from that if you want to talk about that it is what it is. Wow. Well, certainly, um, you have said a lot for us to be able to reflect on. I, I know that when we talk about racism, if we leave out systemic and we just talk about racism at the level of our personal experiences, what I like, I, I, so many things you said that just really resonate with me, but you suggested that it's very important for all of us to speak truthfully about how we have experienced it. And in your case, you said you grew up with parents who taught that your blackness wasn't, was, was beautiful, that your blackness was an asset, and that there was never a reason for you to think that you were less than based on your blackness. So having that kind of foundation provided you with a level of confidence about your own identity that really stayed you well for the journey that you had to make. 
And, and, and those of us who are, who are African-American and more privileged, there's an additional responsibility, as you say, that comes with that. Absolutely. Whether it's the Bible saying too much is, to those whom much is given, much is expected. expected and mm -hmm. Or just a recognition for us as individuals that if you have more than everybody else around you, wouldn't you want others to have what you have? I mean, that's, th these kinds of things don't take big policies for us to figure out. And so there's one side of our conversation that goes to policy. And most of us, if we stay on the policy side, will feel overwhelmed. And we will, we will feel that we don't have access to the levers of power that would allow us to impact policy. But if we drill down to the level of who we are personally, the kind of human being we want to be, then we have immense power to effect the kind of change that actually can end racism in our life. So globally, we may not be able to say today we're going to end racism, and we recognize the absolute reality of its existence. And personally, we can declare in the face of this seemingly overwhelming challenge that we will do everything in our power, in our being, to be an example of its alternative. And that's where I, I really, really situate these conversations. It is in our own power to do something different. So, so I'll go back to this with, with you, uh, Randy. Listening to Brenda's conversation, mm -hmm. What thoughts came to mind? Because you two are, you're, you're, you're similarly situated right. from a social standpoint of, of women, of influence and power and, and status, um, and who similarly uh, have careers that have gone a similar path, a, a general path. So what does it bring up for you? Oh, gosh. Um, as a mother, it brings up hurt and sadness. I mean, I can't imagine as a mother ever wanting anyone to feel that for their children. But, I, you know, I come from a pretty unique situation because I had, came from a family of means. And because of that, a lot of times we were raised by African-American nannies. Yes. And when you typically come from, uh, I've learned this later in life, when you come from a place of means, there's this this sense of being perfect. There's this, you, you're, you know, you have to be perfect. Yes. You have to be better than the next person. And from my, my nanny, and I think probably I could say from um, my mother and, and I think my children, I had a nanny for them. They provided unconditional love for us. It was a place of safety and security. So when I hear this, when Brenda shares her experience, I am just crushed by it because you're talking about people that gave me unconditional love. Yes. So it's an odd place to be. And um, as I said, I mean, I, I think the best part about what the conversation today is that we're talking about it because you can't have, until you have awareness, like Brenda said, you can't have accountability and change. And I think we're finally there as a society. And I think we're finally highlighting and the, shining the light on systemic racism that many of us never saw. So the reason why, I, I mean, this is, organically, this is just working so well is, Brenda, you have, as, a, as an African-American woman, um, you represent so many intersections of marginalization, oppression, and challenges to um, undemocratic 
policies, practices, and a cultural dynamic that in as much as African-American men uh, feel under attack, there's a long history and body of literature that points to African-American women being under that. Um, so there's an element of what you said with respect to your to having to teach your children these normalized lessons around encounters with law enforcement. I'd like to just turn it a little bit and Megan, you and I have had a conversation about uh, an experience you had situated in the church where we, we, we hope that the church is a place that leans into this conversation about Black Lives Matter, systemic racism, and challenges itself internally to be transparent about how, as, a, as an important member of this broader community, the church is going to take a stand. And it has to say what that stand is. And I know in our conversation, one of the things that was an inspiration for me even during the Truth and Reconciliation conversation session um, came out of a challenge that happened here. Tell me a little bit about the experience you had with um, the flag campaign. Um, the flag campaign was born of um, a conversation about the protests that were happening here in Jacksonville and around the country. Um, I, in the midst of them and in making my own protest banners and um, signs, had come to believe that um, the chanting that we did in the protest was much like the chanting we do in yoga or in church, you know, and, um, that there was this full range of emotion and experience represented in what we all carried through the protest and the marches, much like the Psalms. You know, mm -hmm. there was anger and there was fear and there was um, grief and there was um, triumph and, you know, all, it was beautiful. Um, and we talked about prayer flags from that, um, that the signs themselves were like prayer flags that we were holding and our intentions were being carried, you know, hopefully throughout the nation and the city and to touch hearts and lives and to make changes. And so someone had the idea that we would do prayer flags here to hold our intentions and to carry our prayers mm -hmm. through the city of Jacksonville. Um, and so we showed up one morning to put them up, and, um, and I deeply regret taking it down, but I was challenged. Um, I had put up one that said Black Lives Matter, um, very boldly, um, a cute little red heart on it, you know. Um, and that one particularly was not challenged itself to me, but then as a whole, and that justice, the mention of justice in some of them could be controversial. And I said, we just quoted the Bible. Those are the prophets. That's all we did. That's all justice is. Um, but it was obvious that that particular flag was the problem. And, um, and as a compromise to not take all of them down, I took that one down and I took it home. And I said, you know what, I'll fly it at home. <laughs> you know, um, I was invited by someone to bring it back. Um, I just, I haven't yet, which I also deeply regret. Um, because it belongs up there, it does. And, um, and I don't believe that it's a political statement. I believe that it is a statement of black lives have not mattered enough in this country to the powers that be, including in the church itself. And, um, and if we can't say it out loud, if we can't state it 
from here to the people out here. Um, I just feel like we don't have a grasp on the gospel at all. So um, I'll probably actually just make a bigger one and bring it back, <laughs> and we'll see what happens. With it. But um, I don't know. So yeah. But yeah, it was, it was heartbreaking that the idea of justice and Black Lives Matter might be controversial. I thought that would be an easy thing. Yeah. I thought that was going to be like an easy sell, right? Like that's obviously what we should be doing right. and saying. I think, if I could interject, yes. I think the, there is this, this Black Lives Matter organization that people do take offense to. Because if you actually go online and you read some of their, what they believe in. I mean, they don't believe in the traditional family unit. They don't, um, that can be offensive to people. And it's unfortunate that it has the same, because black lives do matter, you know, it, but they get confused. I think there's, I think that's the issue. And I'm sorry that happened, but I, I it's unfortunate that there's this organization with the exact same name. And, and so I, I think that I want to talk about the Black Lives Matter movement, it's an umbrella. And so it is an entity that said, whether you are intersectional because you're an African-American woman, or you have your LGBTQAI, or your target as a trans woman in black, whether you have a non-traditional family structure, so whether you're reared by um, a grandparent, a godparent, um, two men, two women. It's an umbrella for everybody to say, we won't push you out. We're, and so this all black lives matter. And um, it's kind of like you can have the doctrines of something and you can hear them, but you may not agree with all of them, right? You know, right. so you can say, I agree with most of that, but I don't agree with this, you know. Um, and that's what I think Black Lives Matter does, but I think people get sometimes caught up on discrete groups under the umbrella, and that makes them have a, a, a lack of understanding for the term. And for me, it's really simple. Black Lives Matter, why don't we say all lives matter? Because that's never been a given in America. You were never called three-fifths of a person. Yes. You were never three-fifths of a person. Your standing was never based on the race of your mother, which often you could have been the product of your mother who was an African enslaved who was sexually violated by a white man who could have been the slave owner. You didn't get his status in a society that then gave status based on a white male, you got the status of your subordinated mother. So that's why you say Black Lives Matter. I mean, it, if it were a given, we wouldn't watch somebody with their knee on the back of somebody's neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds and no one stop it. And the, the reality is that group around them that I say was blue was ethno-racially diverse. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And that was the first thing I saw. I said, yes. that's why it's blue, you know? Um, and, and that's what that means, you know, it, it's um, because it doesn't, it, 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 it's not, everybody's not treated the same, it's not, it doesn't matter to some. You know, that you think you can justify somebody walking into a, build, a home being built when you chase them down at noon, 50, 60 miles up the road in Brunswick and shoot them because you say you saw them in your neighborhood before in a home being built? So at noon, you hunt them down. And you think it's okay, and we don't find out about it for a while. Months. That black life didn't matter. Because if it does, we would respond the same way when anybody's treated unjustly. It wouldn't be a different standard for certain ones. And that's the reality of what we're dealing with right now. That's what's front and center. That's front and center. And, I, and I'm just gonna call a thing a thing. And I, I believe we were moving more towards 
understanding and awareness. I um, greatly miss President Obama. I did not necessarily agree with these post-racial notions. And my disagreement was the good Lord created us with pigment for a reason. We could have all been opaque. We could have been something else we weren't. So they are not to subordinate anybody else. They are to respect the rich tapestry that we all bring. So let's talk about the experiences. But to, we've gone full circle. We have the most racist, vitriolic president that I can recall in my 53 and a half years. And that's just a fact. I can recall. There weren't good people on both sides in Charlotte, Virginia. There weren't. Call truth and reconciliation. You can't be reconciled if you don't tell the truth. Yes. You can't. You can't. And that's what you're, you can't. No, you, the truth. The truth. The truth. The truth is overwhelmingly African Americans in all walks of life, every socioeconomic group, all over this country and some others, the odds of something negative happening to them are greatly increased. It doesn't matter where they went to school, doesn't matter how many initials behind their name, doesn't matter their family structure, doesn't matter how they dress, doesn't matter where they go worship, the odds are because you can be reduced at any moment to your pigment. And my pigment is not always viewed the same way as yours, Randy, or yours. And that's just, doesn't make it a truth, but it's a reality. Yes. Social reality is a fact, whether or not it is a truth. That's right. It doesn't have to mount up to a truth for social reality to be a fact. Yep, exactly. Of our lived condition. Exactly. So on one side of this, we talk about um, de facto segregation as if this is something that is um, somehow um, unintelligently and haphazardly or almost coincidentally uh, how we arrived here. For example, looking at the makeup of the communities that we see these protests happening in and the uprisings and being able to make statements that politicize the communities based on race yes. without an understanding or the slightest education that those communities were created not simply de facto but a jury constructions. Yes communities. There is policy and law yes. from the New Deal and the redlining that exactly. was baked into exactly. the regulations that became part of Roosevelt's wonderful promise to America. It did not apply to African Americans, even those who had fought bravely in World War II to defend the right that we never were able to fully realize. Exactly. So the FDA participated. So when you say all walks of life for all of us as African Americans, you are absolutely right. None of us escape it. That's fine. The, the, the thing that's always challenging to me, particularly as a dark-skinned African American man, is how to monitor my moments of rage about it. The, 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 what is sometimes triggered in me, I've, I've forced myself to go back multiple times and watch the George Floyd murder to emotionally steady myself for conversations that we have like this. For what it brings up in me
And if I can add, and you don't want you to be angry, even though it's a justified response, mm -hmm. you can't teach our sons and husbands no. to be angry. Because you know what we also taught them? An angry black man is likely to be a dead black man. That's what my mother taught That's me. right. Can I ask a question? What would you like to see? What could, what, what sign or what could, ha what would you like to see that would give you so much hope? Uh, <clears throat> First of all, I'd like to just say that's a, that's a great question. Um, my commitment to my life, because I have and continue to face the anger um, that sparked when I come face to face with the injustices that I see. My response has been over the past 20 plus years is to be an example, a personal example of what the alternative looks like. Rather than putting all of my stock in policy changes, in training for police to change, in the laws of this government and the elected officials to change, I have found that I'm, I, I am more powerful and more in control of what I'm able to do in the face of it when I hold myself to a maximum level of accountability. So for me, um, I was raised very similar to you. Parents who were adamant about my genius and what my contribution should be to the world. And that it was non-negotiable as to what I would do with my gifts. And I went far from the mark. I got really sidetracked, but I never forgot the message. So for me, I'd like for more of us to answer your question directly, personally, individually, granularly, to, to stop our over-reliance on the government and the policies and someone else fixing what we have the power to change right now ourselves. I'm convinced that people are more powerful than governments. And that when people have authentic transformation as part of their experience of love, the government will topple. So it's not to say either or. For me, it's multidimensional. It's, it's a both and. My part, the part that I can do from where I sit, because I'm not a politician, I'm not in law enforcement. I'm just an average citizen with immense power to do good in my individual life with every human being I come in contact. And what I'd like to see is more of us recognize that immense power. So I, I, I think that that is a view that you and I can share because we don't know an other, another view because that was what was whispered to us early yes. on. And so probably your parents were told that. Yes. If you have children, like I've told my husband and I, we tell our children yes. that. The challenge with that for some is that opportunity has not reached everywhere equally. I say we're a yeah. city separated by seven bridges. And for many, there's no crossover to opportunity for other parts. And that's what I don't know that folks understand. And the irony is some who don't have the opportunities aren't even aware of it. And that's what I was going to say a moment ago, Nan, uh, Randy, when we were talking and I was saying that there's a whole group of parents that are our age who thought that if we don't teach our kids the racial realities, then they won't see race. Kind of like parents who may be of another ethno-racial group not teaching their kids the native tongue. Yes. So then, you know, because they felt it conflicted with their being an American. 
you know? Absolutely. And because of that, they don't know, but they think they do. They, young people today, these are the most diverse groups you've ever seen that mm -hmm. are doing things, but they are historically void on some things. They really, really are. They, they don't understand a lot of the underpinnings of what put them to where they are because they largely congregate in homogeneous groups of ethno-racial diversity. Yes, of ethno-racial <laughs> diversity. diversity. And so they think that they are just, we are the world. You are a silo. <laughs> Seriously, that's kind of integration babies. They are, they, you know. Yeah. And so we have to take the time to share with others and create the opportunities. And it's a delicate balance between not becoming paternalistic, but also believing you have an obligation to be your best, to be productive and engaged, or to bring about the change you want to see, right? Yes. But everybody doesn't feel that way, you know? So it's, um, you know, one of the things I do on the city council, and I want to say, I don't know about Randy, I thought we were doing public service, we were going to have fun, do some cool kind of things. <laughs> we had no idea we would have a pandemic, yeah. ethno-racial unrest, after we just got off of the attempt to sell our municipal utility. Yeah. And I, I don't think either one of us thought this is what we were signing up no. for. Uh -huh. you know, but God gave us like spirits, compatible energy, and with some yeah. others to go on and address it. But I won't even pretend to say when we thought about this two to three years ago, maybe I'll run for city council. I said, no, I would have probably said, pass on by, go on by. But we, we've got to make certain that we share it with young people. Yes. And let them know, even if they, the existence of structural racism barriers is not an excuse for you not to do your best. That's right. Well, I mean, we, they, yes, that's right. Because, I mean, because let's be clear, they are smart and savvy, so mm -hmm. they can give a sob story and a victimization account to you better than anybody else because they're smart like that. Yes. Now let's help you move those smarts <laughs> and intelligence, you know, into an arena to help you be more productive. Those are the things you have to navigate to figure out how to do. You know, one of the things my dad said to me when I was going to the University of Florida College of Law, and um, I had originally started law school in Rutgers. We moved back down here, and so I withdrew. My I'd never quit anything in my life, so I literally withdrew, came down here, and my husband and I um, were having our second son. And so I got into Florida. That was the only place I applied. I said, I'll go back, I guess I'll go there. And my dad looked at me and said, while you're at Florida, your head is in the lion's mouth. You have to ease it out. Oh. And he would call me my whole name, Brenda Alexis Priestley. Now Jackson, listen to what I'm saying. And, my, and basically what he was saying was, you have to find yourself in a position to help others. You are expected to do that, but don't count yourself out before you begin. Yes. And that's what I, you know, when Florida had Richard Spencer coming, mm -hmm. and our son was on the football team, and our daughter was getting her LLM, and they were talking about protests. I said, absolutely not. You did not go down to the protest. You will come home. We're safe in Jacksonville. Yes. Well, they clown down there because those folks who come aren't even in college. Mm -hmm. See, Brent, you just, just the <laughs> fact of you saying that <laughs> as an African-American mother, the expectation, in fact, the demand that you put on them is precisely the, the demand that my mother put on me when she found out I had joined the Black Panther Party for <laughs> self-defense. She, this was the most outrageous, ridiculous, absolutely just personally stupid thing for me as she looked at me. Because her thing was, you have, we have moved into this neighborhood you have this school, you have all these opportunities because we have created them for you. This did not happen by Santa Claus. Yes. This was created for you. And what you're doing here jeopardizes all of it. And my mother said to me, one of two things is going to happen to you if you continue down this path. And I say it all the time because I like young people to hear it, but I'd also like, I like the fact that parents can rethink what they say. My mother said, you will either be shot down in the streets and I will have to come and collect your body like a dog, or you're going to end up in prison 
living at the bottom of life and I will not come and visit you because I will not be able to bear the sight of my child, the one I gave birth to, in that place because they didn't listen. So this thing that you told your sons, all of these years later, I'm 61, and here we are in this age, this generation, and you told them not to participate. That's right. And daughter. And daughter. That's right. Um, um, and, I, and, I, and, and so part of it, I think, until recently, this concept of protest was romanticized. Or I, 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 yes, I know. You know and, and every parent had to have that conversation. My dad said the same thing to me. We, we were really, I went to Grammy and I'm laughing because Kwame Ture would spend a lot of time. As my dear friend, Kwame Ture. But he would, he would come to Grambling and talk to us. So yes. there was a group called the All African People Revolutionary, Revolutionary Party. Party. And I fancied myself a member. My dad said, if you don't get out of that communist group, I said, Dad, it's not scientific socialism. I don't it's care what you call it right now. And you know what he said to me then? You don't know what you want to do with your life. Yes. And so he had lived through the McCarthy era, right? Yes. Yes. He had lived through targeting. He knew. Yeah. And so he said, well, I, you don't. And so I think sharing that with young people today to say there's a ways of engagement, but the, we, we also need all of us in different arenas to create the access. There's not one way to do it. Right. There's, that, there's not. So, but don't count your, if your calling is this, you want to heed the calling. And so that's what God has shared to you that you're called to do. Count yourself out before you begin, because because I said, if you know you're more likely to experience disparate impact of something because of your race, then it becomes incumbent upon you to mitigate against that. You yes. might not be in a position just yet to change the system. Yes. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. you. So be better. Look this, talk this way. Look, it, it doesn't make it a right, but it's a reality. Right. Brenda, I... I know that experience so well. By the time I ended up in prison, at the bottom of life, as my mother predicted, when I got there, I remember how much I resented my mother for insisting that I would be so strong academically. And thank God I had the aptitude to do what she wanted because my brother didn't but I excelled, but I resented her for it. When I got to prison and saw the level of illiteracy, mm -hmm. when I saw men three times my age unable to write their name on their prison ID badge, and when I, when I first encountered it, I thought this was an aberration. This can't be, this probably just this one guy. He's, mm. can't, doesn't, he's not able to read. Cellmate after cellmate, situation after situation. I was pushed up to jobs in prison for no other reason than I was so literate. And then I was so literate. Mm -hmm. That's how I was able to get into a program that's no longer in prisons, on prison education, uh, where Pell funding, mm -hmm. the Pell grant, allowed me to attend Boston University, and I earned my bachelor's and master's degree from Boston University while I was in prison, the same prison that Malcolm Little became Malcolm X, Norfolk Prison Colony, and the same university that Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. became Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Boston University. I recognized in that moment the historical significance of all my activism because I too was a member of the All African People's Revolutionary Party and Kwame Ture was a very good friend of mine and he visited me in prison. So I saw the intersection and recognized at the heart of it it was up to me 
to give meaning to that moment that would be transcendent of the circumstances I found myself in. So, yeah. Yeah, and my dad said, don't sign. I didn't sign. I said, well, I can't feel like this paper. He said, you do not know where you see, see that paperwork later on in life. This is for the smartphone era, yes. right, you know? So, wow. Yes. Well, look, OK, so as we bring this wonderful conversation to a close, uh, I'd like to just have each of you share why this kind of conversation is important to you. And anything else that you might want um, our viewers to know. And I guess we'll start with you, Randy. And then. Okay. Well, it's important to me because, you know, it's really, when you boil it down, again, it's all about community. And I love this community. I love Jacksonville, Florida. And for us to succeed as a city and a community, all parts of our community have to succeed. And when I hear Brenda talking, it always just hits me. You know, I really think it's going to be, this is my belief, that in order for us to fix this, it's going to take the women. Because we're mothers. Yes. You know, as mothers, we, we can fix this. Yes. yes. And um, I really believe if we all come together, the women, things will change. Well, I'm certainly prepared to follow the women in leading to change. Um, Either of you? Maybe. Um, I, I, for me, I, I love scripture. I love the Bible. Um, it's my favorite thing to like geek out about. And it's full of stories, and it's all our stories. And I believe that stories are what connect us. And when we hear each other's stories, it opens up our shared humanity um, and helps us appreciate the similarities and the differences. Um, and I'm glad to get to be a part of that. Um, I just, you know, I mean, people are people, and I, I have deep faith in love and in God's faithfulness to us, and that if we, you know, especially the moms, you know, we push this forward, we, we embrace one another's children, all people as children of God. Um, you know, we can, we can be part of that reconciling Christ consciousness. Yes. So, um, but we've got to do it. And also, um, I feel like if anybody can mess something up, it's me. And if anybody can say the wrong thing, it's probably me. Um, but I think that God can use that. Yes. Um, I think we have to have the tolerance for ourselves to say the wrong things and to admit how we've been wrong. Um, and I haven't even gotten started here. I mean, like, that would be a whole other <laughs> hours of conversation. Um, we've got to, because that's where we start. We have to start by admitting the truth. And it's an ugly truth. It's a really ugly truth. And it can be reconciled and it can be healed. Um, so. That's why I'm glad we're doing this. I think for um, me that it's, it's about a life of faith, right? And I believe that God puts each person on earth for a unique purpose. And a part of the journey is finding out what yours is. And once you find out and you serve, then you're expected to help others find their way. And so I've always known that education and advocacy, particularly for the least of these, whoever they are, was a calling for me. And that's a faith calling, you know? And, and the beauty is God does not by fiat say you shall do and you will do, right? Mm -hmm. That's right. But forks in the road. I've learned in 53 and a half years, the path of lesser resistance is often said, okay, God, you said that which way? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, okay, I, I don't always jump on it, you know? And, and that's what, what it is. Um, I'm not angry with what's happening now, um, but I am really making certain that I listen to what others share of different ethno-racial groups for their land. Some things are very obvious to us, and I, because it's a different lived experience. So I would ask God to open my eyes and ears to the understanding of others um, and find the best way to share, because some are way off base. 
you know, these individualized notions of bad actors and bad choices, you know, you know but not just cut it off, you know. And, and I'm encouraged, I do. I, I'm, I'm encouraged. It's painful, though. It, it's painful because those who've experienced adverse um, circumstances, with, and particularly ethnoracially, you know it when it happens, but you don't live in it. You leave it because that's the only way you keep your joy. Yes, absolutely. But this racial reckoning has been bringing it all back, and then you can remember, and then you remember the next thing, and then you remember the next thing, and then you remember the next thing. And you have to, that's why I have my journal. And you pray, Lord, and let me leave that with you and go on to serve. And so I'm encouraged that we'll be able to do that. So I appreciate sharing this conversation. Well, I'd like, um, Megan, for you to um, close with a prayer. I'd like you to lead us in a meditation or prayer of your choice. Mm. Let us pray. Because the Spirit prays better for us than we pray for ourselves. Let us take a moment to sit in the loving presence of God. Lord, thank you so very much for the gift of the people here, for their hearts and their minds, for their courage and sharing. Thank you for the work you are doing through us and through this project, through this cathedral. Guide us, Lord that we may continue to turn towards you, towards one another, opening our hearts and our minds, trusting that you can hold it all, trusting that your love is at work, even when the hate feels overwhelming, even when the fear feels overwhelming. Thank you so much for all of this. We humbly repent the sin of racism. We humbly repent our willful ignorance of it, and I say that as a white person. And we ask, Lord, for forgiveness and for mercy and grace. And that that grace, mercy, and forgiveness flows through all of us. And that truth and love unite us. Amen. 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 Thank you so much for Thank this you. conversation today. Thank you. Thank you.